morning, Pastor Tim Maddox. It's the 20th of March, and I need to tell you a few things. We're headed to Easter. Easter is April 17th. That means the week before Easter on Wednesday night, we will come and celebrate the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, when he instituted the thing that all us Christians do, and that's coming to his table. That's where it all started. And so we're going to celebrate that on Wednesday before Easter. But on Palm Sunday before that, we're going to baptize. And some of you, out of sheer obedience to God, need to be baptized. Um, If I tell my 76-year-old father he needs to be baptized, he gets baptized. Wow, that's amazing because you know what? Uh, The very chapter we're in this week in uh, the Gospel of John, Jesus said, if you want to be close to him, you must Obey him in different things, and baptism is one of those things. I don't say it in any heavy-handed fashion. It's just part of your following Christ. And, and we do practice full immersion just like Jesus did. Just like, and so we do do that here at Northside. So I hope, you, I hope if you're ready to go, then contact us, and let's get her done Palm Sunday. Okay, the passage today, and we are on critical conversation number two. The passage is John 14, one of the most famous passages in John in the Bible. It's amazing. Uh, I hope you find some help here. And so here we go, um, John 14, verses 1 through 11. Get your Bible or your app and check it out. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, in my father's house, are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, We don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been with you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who's doing the work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. At least believe in the evidence of the miracles themselves. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's amazing. It is profound. It is beyond our comprehension. So somehow, through your spirit, through me today, speak words to those listening that would create faith, would create hope, would create love, that your spirit works even on couches or computer screens that that you can speak into a life. And so do that today for us. Guide us through this amazing story. In Jesus' name, amen. So this critical conversation number two is is, uh, very profound. And, um, you know, we have been... Uh, in the Gospel of John, and what I want to do, what I'm really working to do, just so you know, is to let John tell us about Jesus. Let John bring to us exactly what he thinks we need in order, as he says in his Gospel several times, in order that you'll believe. I mean, really believe. Mental assent is not belief. Yeah, I believe in Christianity. No, John wants you to believe in Jesus, and that brings me to a very important point. It's personal. Knowing God is a personal thing. And that's why you hear Christians in all stripes, all the way across the Christian spectrum of Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, is that do you know Jesus? 
Is he your personal Savior, forgiver, Lord? It's always personal. It is never distant. You get to know people personally. You don't get to know people from a distance. The internet uh, over the last 25 years has created an illusion sometimes that we actually know people that we don't. It is uh, fashioned in such a way that there's, it's low touch and low reality. And so uh, we, need, we are in a culture and we have been out of circulation with COVID and so many things that we need high touch. We need to personally be with, this, with each other. It is very important. The Christian faith is an embodied faith. It is not a distant faith. It is an upfront and personal faith. So I want to look at this with um, three points. Here's the three points. First, Jesus is dealing with their fears. Secondly, Jesus is helping them face their confusion. Thirdly, Jesus is helping them, check this out, find God. How do you find God? Or does God find you? So the first thing is dealing with the fears. If, you, if we go back to the setting, if we keep John, uh, let John tell us the last week of Jesus' life, and we're, he's, he's having a critical conversation. Now remember, he just last week washed their feet, and in that section right there, that's when uh, Judas uh, left the room, what's going on. Uh, think about it this way. They're in Jerusalem, which is during Passover week. Uh, it's like being in New York on New Year's Eve. It's packed. If you and I were able to go to Jerusalem during Holy Week, you would see the packed pilgrims everywhere. So Jerusalem is packed. Jesus has... It, been in there several times, healed people. Uh, he's being hunted uh, by uh, the religious leaders, and they're recruiting every uh, thing they can to help get him, the Romans, whoever is available, their own little security that they had. And so Jesus, Jesus has created conflict. Uh, so it's swirling around. Uh, a strange thing with Judas. Uh, he went out, he disappeared. What's going on there? Jesus talking about someone betraying. They're so confused. They don't know if they're pitching or catching. You know what I'm saying? They really don't get it. And we sometimes really, even religious worker, even pastors, all of us don't get what God is doing. And so this very tense environment, so the disciples are nervous. They're not really sure about Jesus and this, you know, he's saying he's dying. Oh, I'm not sure about that. You know, they're still confused. And so Jesus starts out this critical conversation with something very important, doesn't he? He deals with their fears. There it is. Verse 1, chapter 14, critical conversation number 2. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. That's what Jesus says. Isn't that interesting? Isn't life full of nearly nonstop trouble? It is. Uh, we just like the reprieve, so we just like the rest, but we just like a moment of not conflict, don't we? And so Jesus, and, and he said, in this world, same book, in this world you'll have tribulation. I give you peace. Peace give I to thee, not as the world gives. The world has peace. Uh, you can, you know, blow your minds with uh, drugs, alcohol, sex, just experience after experience. You could escape, escape to find some kind of peace. But Jesus says, no, stay in the thing and let me give you your peace. Stay in the thing. So he's just trying to get his disciples. All he needs from is not perfection. He just says, stay in the thing, man. Stay with me. Isn't that cool? It's kind of cool that Jesus, hmm, I see that he wants us. He needs us close to him. And he keeps trying to keep them close to him. Isn't that funny? Such a strange thing. And so 
what Jesus does, he, you know, there, there's this situation um, that, that, you know, we, we wake up and the news, uh, used to be that just the president knew everything going around the world. He gets a situation report. That's what they call him in the military. What's a situation report? And so <laughs> the situation report in Jerusalem is that it's tense. They're after Jesus. I don't know what Judas is doing. And this is creepy. They're afraid. Very afraid. And so he says, trust in me. So he speaks those words. And if there's anything that God speaks constantly to his people, Old Testament and New, it's don't be afraid. Because here's the deal. Here's what's really critical in that. Jesus does not want their fear to overturn their actions. He does not want them, the, the fear, their feelings, to get into their will, their choice mechanism that we all have, the will. You know how we can choose to do things and not, even if we feel good or not? You know how when you get a, you're having an argument with somebody in your house, you get a phone call and then you answer real nice, hello, how are you doing? Our will told us to do that. And Jesus doesn't want their wills overthrown by their fear in the moment. What's also interesting is how Jesus deals with their fears. This is really interesting. So he says these words, and then he goes into a talk about heaven. Can you believe it? That's a strange thing. He goes into a talk about heaven. There it is in verse 2. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back. I'm going to take you to be with me. You... You know where, you know the way where I'm going. Isn't that funny? People do want to know about heaven. And so uh, Jesus it goes into a talk about heaven that we would have confidence in this. And believe me, the older you get, the more that will be a concern of yours. A concern of yours. Is God real? Is there really a place? Is this real? Because I can't see it. And maybe I can't feel it. But Jesus is speaking words of faith. The book of Ecclesiastes says, eternity is in the heart of men. We know that we are meant to live forever. I love Dallas Willard who passed on a great philosophy professor at USC. He, said, he says to his freshman philosophy class, because they're all you know, jumbled up there and they're all there on their maybe scholarships or their parents' diamond. He said, hey, what if you have to live forever? Hey, what if you really have to live forever? What does that mean? What does it mean? And Jesus just says, hey, there's a place. And so we want geography. We want to nail it down. And God chooses to give us this. I remember walking out of Baylor Hospital, downtown Dallas, this family's mother had just died, and we're in between these very tall buildings, and there's a helicopter landing above the ER with more trouble, and, I, and the, it's real loud, and the family gets up to me, and they get right up in my face, and they say, and, and their mom knew the Lord, and they say, but it was a, you know, kind of slight Christianity on the rest of their part, I think. And they said, well, what happens now? Where is she? He wanted to know. So I popped this out. It just, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Your mom's there. I don't have to know where the there is. Do you have to know where the there is? Did God have to tell you everything? Or is, is the fact that he doesn't tell us everything about the next life a, a way that we won't want to jump there too soon? You know, that, that he needs us in this world for this time. We all have assignments. We've all been gifted. It's there. It's real. He needs us to do our job of being Jesus in our environment, with our family, with our community, with our jobs, everything. He needs you to be the Christian he called you to be. Maybe that's why we don't get it. We could talk about the geography of heaven. And, but his point in the heaven promise, 
because the Bible's full of promise, is to give the disciples courage. Okay, it's going to be tough right now, but God's going to take care of us in the end. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. And he's coming back to get them. Jesus comes back. And, and that, don't you need your kids to tr- Don't you want your kids to trust you when you leave for a day and they say, well, when you be back? You know, when they're younger, they especially, when you be back, mom, dad, you're leaving me. I kind of hear echoes of that. And so Jesus recognizes our fears. He tells us to trust him. And he does because he doesn't want our fears to overturn our decisions to follow him. So that leads us to the next point, facing our confusion. And that is rampant with disciples. If you are experiencing these things, I'm talking about you are a normal (laughs) disciple. Okay, you're a normal follower. You're a normal Christian. Whatever word you choose to put on yourself because you believe in Jesus, they're all barking at it in just a different angle. It's all the same. So here we go. Thomas and Philip get a part in this story. John remembers them popping off. Are you ever with some people and there's always one dude that just kind of pops off or one chick that always says zany things? And so, so here's, our, here's our two pop-off experts. It goes, here goes Thomas. You ready? In verse 5, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know a way? I almost can hear a tone like that. What do you mean you're the way? And then Jesus brings that answer that's put on church walls around the world. Jesus answered, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, there it is. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So um, I have a, when we think of a way, we think of maps. I I don't know if you remember the transition from, uh, you know, uh, maps in your glove box. (laughs) <laughs> like all of us have had uh, to the transition to Apple Maps or Google Maps or, or uh, MapQuest or all the different things. But I remember uh, my son um, uh, was in uh, San Francisco for a number of years going to college and uh, finished up there. And so we made, uh, I, I can't count the trips, and, and uh, we had to move him one time. And I left by myself in a rented pickup truck. And probably about two hours later, I found them. There was a phone problem, and then my map. I don't know if you've been to San Francisco lately, or Daly City, and and, and North San, or South San Francisco, and all that area. But it's hilly, and there's no square streets, and it's just wild. And I just went around in circles for hours. Finally, found my way. But when we think of, and so. Philip is saying, well, you know, when he says the way, Jesus is saying like a path. You know, a little dirt path in the woods. I, I grew up in Colorado. We were always on a dirt path going somewhere. Roads, Callaway right there, 99, the 5, you know, all the different freeways. They're all paths and roads. And so Jesus wasn't saying, I'm a road. He's saying, I'm a way. But he was saying, I'm a road. Because Jesus uses metaphors. A metaphor is a word picture. A picture to give us room to connect the visible and the invisible, the kingdom of God and us. This world that we say is so real and the real world of God. Jesus in the Gospel of John has some famous statements. They're the I am's. And so, Here's, he's on the I am number six right here. He says, I am the bread of life. Do you remember when he fed the thousands? Then he said, I am the light of the world. John 1 reminds us that Jesus was the light that darkness was pushing against. And and here he is in a dark moment, the last few days of his life. Darkness is all around him. He's still the light. He's the door for the sheep. That's a gate, you know, into a field where you keep your sheep safe. He's a door. He's a good shepherd, and then he told uh, Lazarus and his sisters, look, I'm the resurrection of life. Okay, so is Jesus a door? Mm, Not really. Is Jesus a slice of bread? Mm, Not really, you know. But it's a metaphor to give room to understand what God can do. Was he light? Yes. You could find your way with him. Uh, was he bread? Oh yeah, he would feed you. 
Was he adored? Did he, did he get sheep safely into the right field? Yes. Is he a good shepherd? Oh my, he was a good shepherd. Is he the resurrection life? Does, can he create life from death? Yes, he did. Remember Lazarus. So all these things. And today he is saying, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All things that we have difficulty with, he's a, he's a path, he's a way. And uh, so he's using that metaphor, the word picture, to say, look, if you're with me and you stay close to me, you're on the path. If you stop looking at me and just, you know, look to your own thinking, your own believing, your own way to fix your life, then you're probably going to get off the path, most definitely. You'll go astray as sheep go astray. You'll be one of the sheep over there. I don't know if you're around sheep when you were young, but I was. I was uh, raised in a very small town on the, close to Indian, on Indian reservations and up there in the Four Corners area. And we would drive and frequently there'd be massive herds of sheep and they did not know where they're going. And you know, sheep are so, mm, it is got one of God's uh, names for us. They're so dumb that they will follow each other off a cliff to their death. Did you know that? Wow, that's not a complimentary picture. So we need to keep our eyes on him, don't you think? Man, I do. I do. I do. Leading a church, oh my gosh, trying to lead a church. So there's a meta. So we, we face our confusion and we give our confusion to Jesus. And, and he says, you will know it if you stay close to me. You will stay on the path. You'll stay on the path and you'll be able to find your way. Jesus is your way through your problems, through your fears, through your parenting, through your jobs, through your life. Jesus is the way that we move forward with God in our lives. So, Jesus deals with their fears. There's this sort of strange, and then this answer from heaven, and then he, he uh, deals with their confusion, you know, uh, uh, Thomas, doubting Thomas, pops off, and he's still confused, and he's confused to the very end, isn't he? Because at some point, Thomas finally confesses that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. Did you know that? After the resurrection, when he got to touch the nail-pierced hands and the spear in the side, when he physically could hold him. Okay, I believe now. Some of you are like that. You're very empirical. You're, you, you need to touch it. You need to feel it. And, and Philip got his got his chance, and we get our chance too, huh? It's, uh, or, or Thomas. And then there's Philip finding God. So Philip, is it's his turn to pop off. And what does he say there in verse 8? It's pretty, pretty cool. He says, Lord, Jesus, you know, I follow you. I, you're my Lord. I, I do what you say. That's Lord stuff, doing what they say. He says, Lord, Show us the Father, and that will be good enough for us, and we'll do whatever you want. So Philip wanted to see God, God Almighty, <laughs> you know, the God of all things, of everything. He wants to see the Father. <laughs> and Jesus' answer is, is very telling. Are we not, you and I, Super quick forgetters of the things God has just shown us. What did Philip see? Oh, I know. He saw everything. Did he see Jesus walk on water? Did he see Jesus feel? Did he see Jesus heal and heal? Did he see Jesus cast out demons? Did he see Jesus? He just saw all this stuff for three years. It was intense. It was shocking. It was overwhelming. And he just forgot it all. Isn't that amazing? I can do that. Can you do that? He just forgot it all. Ha, huh, you know? And, and so Philip... Jesus tries to remind, put back his mind in him, because Jesus is tangible. He's in reality. He's in the truth. He's, he's tangible. And he just says, uh, look, Philip, after all this time, it's such a long time, Philip. Uh, anyone who has seen me, and Jesus points to himself, 
Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, has seen God. How can, why would you even ask me that, Philip? That's really what he says when he says, show us, how can you say, show us the Father? Uh, and, and, and he kind of hammers a little more, don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father's in me? The words I say are not mine, rather they're the Father living in me who's doing the work. He's doing the work, God's doing the work. Okay, what we have here, guys, is amazingly profound. Are you ready? This is where the triune God is clearly active in a very open way. God the Father is speaking through Jesus the Son. And of course, Jesus is getting ready to leave and then the Spirit will take over. It is God at work. God at work. We believe in a triune God. God the Father. And so Jesus said, it, it's simple. It's really, really simple. He just said, Jesus said, you have seen God. Hey, Philip, you have. I'm it. I am God in a bod. I am. He didn't say I'm third person of the Trinity, the one God yet triune. You know, he didn't do all that confusing stuff that we have a hard time getting our minds around. He just said, you know, you want to know God, you see me. And you know what's really interesting about that for us as Christians is that is played out for us as well. People see God when they see him through us. I will never forget the first day, that first week I was on the campus of this property after being a church plant, and I was starting to meet all the people. We had, they asked us to come in and, and me to be the pastor and take over, and I went and met a woman named Darlene Bider, and I, was, I went to meet her because she worked over at Walmart. And there used to be a Kmart down here too where you could have breakfast, and so I was meeting all the coffee clatch people in the church. And so I went over to just see Darlene and I saw her working at Walmart and I saw the way she was handling people. And I, you know, God, it's God's choice when we see things. Open our eyes, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And I saw Darlene and I saw Jesus working at Walmart. I'm serious. I saw Jesus working at Walmart. Think about that. Get your heart around that. Get your mind around that. Jesus deals with our fears. He deals with our confusion. And he brings God to us and to all people. And then we bring God to all people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. I pray um, anybody that hears your word today would be that your spirit would do the work that needs to be done, the work that I cannot do, but you do, Lord. You are still at work, redeeming people, encouraging people to obey you so they can find their way. God, we need a way in this crazy world. We lift up all the people in Ukraine who are being assaulted right now and dying. And God, you are their way to give. We ask you to save all that you can. And Lord, um, we uh, ask for mercy. We would ask you to intervene in that whole situation. Our world has always been troubled and continues to be. Lord, help us to not be overturned by our fears, our confusion, and our doubts. In Christ's name, amen.